Welcome everyone um, to the conference. I'm just going to share with you some opening slides. I'll get my script ready. So hello everyone, a very warm welcome. I'm Francis O'Brien, one of the co-chairs um, of our 62 organising committee. Before I introduce the conference, I'd like to cover a few points that will help you to get most out of using the Zoom platform. Firstly, we recommend that you position the speaker in the top right of your screen so that you can see your slides. Um, how do you ask questions? There are two ways of communicating. There's the chat function, and we suggest that you use that to send us messages rather than raising your hand. And for questions in these webinar sessions, there is a Q&A function where you can type your questions and then the chair of the session will read out your questions to the speaker. Now there's also this facility where you can upweight questions and that is really useful if there's loads of questions and it helps us to work out which are the most important ones that you really would like an answer to. Now, during some of the sessions, there will be these interactive polls, which we invite you to participate in, but you can't get to these um, if you're using a browser. Now, all of our conference sessions are going to be recorded. Uh, the videos will then get edited and they'll be made available firstly through the app and then later on, you'll be able to access them via the OR Society website. In this welcome session, I'll give you an overview of the conference before I hand over to Edmund Burke, our president, who will welcome you on behalf of the society. Finally, I'll hand over to my co-chair, Jürgen, who will introduce our first plenary speaker. When the committee first met back in February of this year, we were planning our usual conference at the University of Warwick, where I'm based. We'd done the tour of campus to check the facilities on offer, and we were moving full steam ahead with the planning when lockdown hit in late March. It became clear quite soon into that lockdown that we would be unable to hold the face-to-face -face conference that we've grown to love over the years. Instead, we explored how we could facilitate an event with many of the characteristics that have formed the staple of our UK OR Society Annual Conference. Thus, we've worked really hard to develop an exciting programme with many of the key characteristics of our annual conference and also with some new additions. As is usually the case, our conference is running over three days with the additional pre-day that ran yesterday. Now they say every cloud has a silver lining and one of the opportunities that we have taken advantage of given our current situation is to attract a truly international gathering of speakers and delegates from around the world. 
We're therefore thrilled to welcome over 1,300 registrations to the conference app. Now this represents more than a threefold increase compared with our most successful face-to-face -face conference in recent years. We particularly welcome those of you who would not otherwise have had the opportunity to join us for our annual conference, those of you who aren't members of the Society and those of you who are overseas. So to accommodate our global audience, we've kept the schedule of sessions predominantly to the middle of the day UK time. I'll now share with you some of the highlights of our conference. Firstly, we're delighted to welcome our three plenary speakers with one scheduled on each day of the conference. We begin today with Dimitris Bersimas, who will talk on interpretable AI. On Wednesday, we move to the softer side of our field uh, with our systems plenary, Ellen Lewis, who will talk on inclusive systemic evaluation. On Thursday, we finish our trio of plenaries with Patrick Reed, who will talk on conflict, coordination and control. This year, we have developed a programme of parallel sessions covering a broad range of OR topics and themes using a mix of different formats. Some sessions centre around one speaker, some sessions have short talks from multiple speakers and other sessions then uh, explore the views of expert panellists discussing topical issues. The UK OR Society has always been proud of our heritage in encompassing the full spectrum of approaches in OR and our annual conferences reflect this with their coverage of both quantitative and qualitative or hard and soft OR. Another feature of our annual conference that we've worked hard to maintain is the mix of academic and practitioner speakers and delegates that are contributing from across the globe. Our conference began yesterday with the pre-day when two of the society's special interest groups hosted events. The pro bono special interest group ran the first session uh, targeted at charities who were looking for analytical support and the Women in OR and Analytics Network in conjunction with the Euro Wisdom Forum hosted a panel discussion on the theme of women in leadership. Also yesterday, there was an early careers workshop targeted at those beginning their research career in OR. An important element of all our annual conferences is the networking opportunities that are there between sessions. It's much, har it's much harder to do this virtually, but the society has been experimenting during lockdown and we've successfully run some networking sessions during our events. Thus, both today and tomorrow, we will have an informal networking session where we'd encourage you to come along with your coffee or your glass of wine. And within Zoom, we'll create small, uh, small breakout rooms, small groupings where you can get to know the other delegates and have a chat with them. We've also kept the ever popular pub quiz and that takes place this evening at six o'clock UK time. Another of the features that we've incorporated into, incorporated into the conference is the President's Medal Competition and Award. This year, I'm delighted to say we have three entries um, from teams and they will each make their presentation in the session tomorrow. There's the opportunity for um, you to vote for your favourite uh, team. And then we will announce the winner during the closing ceremony on Thursday. For several years now, the conference has run a session looking at grand challenges facing the local community where the conference has been based. And I'm delighted to say that we're, we will be running a grand challenge session this year on Thursday's final conference day. It will be a virtual interactive session facilitated by Miles Weaver. So do add this to your schedule if you haven't already. As we're a virtual community this year from across the globe, we've chosen a topic with relevance to all nations and communities, that of the UN Sustainability Goals, and how we within the OR community can build back better after COVID. Running any conference isn't without its costs, and even a virtual event such as this is no different. We're therefore very grateful to our sponsors, Simulate, DSTL, Sirius and Invenia Labs for their generous support 
of the conference. During the conference, we'd encourage you um, to get involved through social media. There's the OR62 hashtag that you can use with whatever social media you're familiar with. And we'd also encourage you to upload um, a photo of your conference experience. I'm at the moment trying to get my dog to come and sit next to me, which is what she usually does. And so I hope I'll be able to upload a photo of me with my pet later on. I'll now hand over to the president of the UK OR Society, Edmund Burke, for a few words of welcome. Good, good morning, everyone, and a very, very warm welcome to the first online OR Society conference. I'm uh, delighted to, um, to welcome you all. It's been a challenging time for the Society in line with organisations across the world, and there's a particular challenge around hosting the conference and, and I've been so impressed with the way in which the organizers and the OR Society staff have risen to that challenge and have provided us this conference in a, in a virtual space. Their professionalism and their dedication has been truly, truly admirable. So I'm, I'm really uh, impressed by that and I'm very much looking forward to the conference. It's the biggest conference say, society has uh, ever held. I hope you have a really great time. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I just want to say, welcome, have a good time. It's a pity we're not all together in Warwick, but we will be next year. But we are all together virtually. Thank you. Thanks very much, Edmund. I'd now like to hand over to my colleague, Jürgen, who will introduce our first plenary speaker. Okay, hello everyone. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce today's plenary speaker, uh, Professor Dimitris Betsimas. Professor Betsimas is Boeing Professor of Operations Research at MIT, and the list of his achievements is long, so let me just uh, mention a few highlights. Professor Betsimas is the editor-in-chief of the relatively new INFORMS journal on optimization and uh, has been department editor for management science and also for operations research. He has supervised 76 doctoral students and he is currently supervising 25 others. I wish my dean would uh, listen to this because my dean thinks professor should not have more than four PhD students at a time, uh, I think. Is, is uh, not enough <laughs> or could be, could be more. Professor Betsimas is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, an INFORMS fellow, and he has received numerous research and teaching awards, including the John von Neumann Theory Prize for fundamental sustained contributions to the theory of operations research and the management sciences and the President's Award of INFORMS recognizing important contributions to the welfare of society. But he has also done very practical things and co-founded six companies over the years. And since March, he has led a group of 30 doctoral, master and postdoctoral students to study multiple aspects of COVID-19. In my view, Professor Batsimas is one of the brightest minds in our field. The breadth and the volume of his research is astounding. He has made outstanding contributions to theory and practice of operational research and in diverse fields such as financial services, transportation and healthcare. His research has been cited more than 37,000 times according to Google Scholar. Last but not least, already very early on, Professor Betsimas realized the important connection between operational research and machine learning. Um, demonstrating how valuable OR techniques can be in the area of machine learning. Also today's plenary will be on this topic. Professor Betsimas, I'm looking forward to your talk on interpretable AI.
Can you hear me, Jürgen? Yes, we can hear you. But you cannot see me, right? That's right. Okay. Uh, should I? I, I was able to see your slides. Yes, yes, I. Um, I'm nearly there. Okay. So, so hopefully you can now hear me and see me. Yes, I can see your slides. I cannot see your video. Well, I don't control the video. I'm afraid. Uh, it seems to me that. Uh, you have to um, do this. I don't think we can. I think at the bottom of Zoom, you can click on start video. Yes, now I can see your video. Okay. I'm sorry for the compl complexity here. Perfect. Okay. Uh, good morning uh, for me. <laughs> good day for you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be participating in, um, in the conference and, uh, and start it in a way. So today's talk is about some work that I have um, uh, done in the last decade or so on uh, the interplay between uh, AI, machine learning and optimization. So it will have not, I divided the talk into three parts. The first is going to be about interpretability a particular emphasis on that and the idea of optimal classification and regression trees. Then I, I will talk about sparse regression, which also gives us another view of interpretability. And finally, what I call stable regression. So um, before I start, let me give you some motivation of um, the, the talk overall. So it is fair to say that continuous optimization methods have historically played a significant role in machine learning and statistics. And in the last two decades, convex optimization methods have had increasing importance. Compressed sensing, matrix completion are names that come to mind among many others. However, many problems in machine learning and statistics are naturally, can naturally be expressed as mixed integer optimization problems. Uh, however, uh, the field as of mixed integer optimization in the beginning of its, in, in, around 1970s, I would say, with the, with, uh, the emergence of complexity um, and, and the notion of NP-hardness, a belief has been formed, which was, I thought, perhaps justified at the time, that uh, problems expressed in mixing these optimizations were not particularly tractably solved. Uh, and this belief, I would say, permeated uh, to a large degree in several fields uh, and has not been appropriately updated. Even though, um, as I will soon indicate, the field has made very significant progress computationally. So as a result, in the field of statistics, um, heuristics uh, are solved, are, are utilized to solve problems. For example, for those of you who know Lasso for best re subset re regression or CART classification regression trees for classification, for optimal classification. At the same time, um, I would like now to justify that, that perhaps the beliefs that uh, mixed integer optimization are intractable should be perhaps revised. And I've done a small comparison from um, during the period I have been in the field from the early 1990s until today. And without going into great details, it's fair to say that uh, the, both because of hardware and software, uh, if you look at the, today's codes and the codes at, at the time, maybe in, in the early 1990s, uh, we are talking about trillions, trillions with a T, trillions times speed up, um, namely a problem that would have taken 71,000 years to solve 25 years ago uh, with the computers and the software at the time can now be solved in a modern computer with today's software in less than one second. That's, I would say, uh, an accomplishment that has happened because of the uh, work of um, a lot of people in the field. Uh, I think it, this forces us to reconsider what is tractable. So given, so a natural research question is, given that the dramatically increased power of optimization, mixed integer in particular, is mixed integer optimization able to solve some of the key machine learning statistics problems considered intractable a decade ago? 
And how do mixed and desert optimization problems compete with the state of the art solutions? So this is one aspect of the motivation of the talk. Another one is the following. Randomization is a method of choice in a variety of problems in machine learning and statistics. For example, the, one of the most famous methods in statistics, bootstrap, or how to select training and validation sets, randomized clinical trials, random forests, all of these are really uh, randomization-based processes. So the question is, can optimization play a role? And what is its, um, its relative strength relative to randomization? And finally, and quite importantly, because after all, uh, research should inform teaching, what are the implications on teaching of machine learning and statistics? Um, so as an answer to the last question in last year, together with my former student, Jack Dunn at MIT, we published a book with the title of Machine Learning Under a Modern Optimization Lens, where we try to uh, emphasize the link and the usefulness of using optimization in machine learning and statistics. So this is sort of the overall work on the interface um, of uh, machine learning and optimization. Now I will go into interpretability and why I think it's important and why whatever methods we use have to have interpretability as an objective. So it's fair to say that AI and especially deep learning have made significant progress in computer vision, automatic translation, and voice recognition that are affecting society today. However, deep learning suffers from lack of interpretability. Let me give you an example. Suppose you have a driverless car that is involved in an accident with a loss of life for a pedestrian. Who is at fault? The pedestrian, the driver, or the computer vision algorithm? And most importantly, can society tolerate not understanding? I remind us all that uh, the Boeing 737 MAX has been grounded uh, from about uh, two years ago uh, because of two successive accidents that were at the time unexplained and the whole fleet was in fact uh, grounded, including of course consequences for Boeing, uh, change of CO and so forth. So this evidence and many others suggest that society cannot tolerate understanding if there is a loss of life, what is the cause of it? Another example, uh, let's say you have a student who is an exceptionally good student and uh, let's say valedictorian in, in US terms of his or her class and is not selected for, fre for a freshman admission. Yeah. And suppose the, the, the family of the student receives a letter, dear uh, Sarah, uh, we had many applications and your application unfortunately was not selected without any explanation why this decision was made and suppose an algorithm made such a decision. And uh, at least in an environment where the number of applications in the, in the tens of thousands, algorithms are today utilized for these purposes. So I would say that's perhaps not an adequate response. And I could go on, but I would say interpretability matters, especially, especially on, on critical applications. So the goal of this, an additional goal of this research is to develop algorithms that are interpretable and provide state-of-the-art performance. So let me start with uh, uh, perhaps my favorite method in machine learning uh, developed by Leo Breiman in the 1980s. Of how this method works, I will briefly review it, we review it on, a, on a so-called iris data set. The iris data set contains physical measurements of flowers, in this particular case, sepal length and sepal width, and then a classification of the, of the, of the flowers into, let's say, red and blue. So what the method does, it, it starts uh, looking at all possible coordinates and uh, finds a partition that separates the, the, the blue and the red, which is the objective is to classify, into two parts that are as pure as possible. So out of all possible partitions, vertical and horizontal, it selects this one and you can see on the right that is mostly perfect, on the red, on the left, less so. And then it continues recursively, but also greedily on, on the left and on the right. So for example, the next partition on the left is shown here. Uh, and then uh, at some point the method says it stops it says points that are on, the, on this part 
of the of the space. This box are red. On the bottom are uh, light blue, and uh, and similarly for the right. So this process can be can then now uh, be modeled as what is called a, a, a classification tree, namely. The, at the first time, we ask a question where the sepal length is less than a certain level. If it's bigger than a certain level, it is um, a, a blue. Uh, if then we continue, if the sepal width is smaller than something, it's also blue. If it's bigger, then it is, it is a red. So this is a, a very simple example of how CART um, classification uh, and regression trees, in this case, it's just a classification, uh, works uh, in practice. The key aspect of it is that as it was introduced in 1984, uh, it's a heuristic approach to make predictions. It's also, in this case, binary, but can also be used for, for continuous. And um, it is widespread in its use in academia and industry. The, the paper by, the book by Bryman and, uh, and others has more than close to 40,000 citations now. Um, so it is fair to say it had a serious impact, both in the theory and in the practice of machine learning. However, CART is fundamentally greedy. It makes a series of locally optimal decisions, but the final three could be far from optimal. In fact, Leo Breiman in his, in his 94 book acknowledged that, saying that finally another problem frequently mentioned is that the trim procedure is only one step optimal and not overall optimal. If one could search all possible partitions, the two results might be quite different. And he writes that we don't address the problem here at this stage of computer technology, 1984, that is an overall optimal tree growing procedure does not appear feasible for any reasonably sized data set. So the objective of this work that we wrote, we published a paper in 2017 with Jack Dunn, my co-author in the book, we utilize optimization methods and local search methods to, to basically answer the question that Leo Breiman asked in 1984, namely to develop a globally optimal, not greedily optimal method for designing optimal trees, both classification and regression trees. The algorithm scale in the size of about a million points and 10,000 factors, which is, I would say, a practical range, and the reason this can be modeled as a mixed integer optimization problem is you have to decide which variable to split on and which, which, uh, at what, which label to predict uh, for a region. So if you have a, a particular leaf in the tree, should it be uh, class zero or class one? And if there are multiple classes, another class as well. And also which region, which region a point ends up in and whether a point is correctly classified. All these decisions can be appropriately modeled. And then the technology of MISIC, the programming together with local search methods for improving the solution and warm starts can be utilized to solve um, to near optimality the problem. Um, so, and the other advantage is that this method can be generalized to having not only horizontal and, and, and vertical partitions, but also uh, uh, partitions that are hyperplanes. So as you perhaps know, support vector machines provide a split on the space with only one hyperplane. So this does more than that. It partition is, partitions the region um, with hyperplanes so that in each region you divide uh, by hyperplanes. So we have polyhedral partitions and then you classify uh, each region with what the appropriate class is. So we call this optimal classification trees dash H with hyperplanes. The previous one, optimal classification trees, OCTs. So a natural question, of course, is that how does this method compare with the, the traditional CART method? Uh, and you can, uh, so what this does is for 60 real world data sets ranging from small to medium to large problems involving hundreds of thousands of points and, and uh, thousands of, um, of factors, so this is the, the horizontal axis is the depth of the tree. The vertical axis is the out of sample accuracy. The red is the, is the out of sample accuracy for CART. The blue is the out of sample accuracy 
for the optimal classification tree. So you see that for the same level of interpretability, um, because both of them are trees with horizontal and vertical partitions, you add about one, 1.5% of accuracy. And then if you add classifica optimal classification with hyperplanes, you also have significantly higher accuracy, another three to 4%. Altogether, if you utilize all these technologies with optimal classification with hyperplanes, you get a sizable improvement. Of course, the optimal classification trees with hyperplanes is not as interpretable as the optimal classification trees or of card for that matter. However, empirically, we have found that uh, if you apply um, optimal classification with hyperplanes, and especially you can also control how many variables you have per hyperplane, what I call sparsity. So sparsity one, if you only have one variable per hyperplane, this is the, the optimal classification trees. But if you have, let's say two or three, uh, it's a little bit more interpretable. But what we have found in practice is that there are very few partitions that involve more than one variable. So in other words, while it's less, it is fair to say that it is less interpretable of my classification of hyperplanes. It is, it is I would say, you gain uh, accuracy with, a, with a, the, at a loss of some interpretability. So, so we have, and in addition, another interesting observation is that if you compare with the, the most well-known black box methods, what's called random forest and, and uh, X and boosting trees. So random forest is um, the, uh, the Moivre color, the, the, the curve in between CART and optimal classification trees that you see that only with only one tree, the optimal classification tree, you actually have comparable performance with random forest. Uh, surprising finding. Random forest was a method also developed by Brian in the early 1990s that basically averages, generates multiple trees, let's say a thousand trees, and then averages the outcome to find, the, let's say the majority to, to, to determine what the, the, class, the classification is for a particular point. And X, see boost here, this one here, is similar, except that instead of devising trees completely at random, you find the first tree, and then you see what mistakes the first tree makes. You build the second tree that classifies the mistakes, and, you f and then you continue recursively, and then you average the, the trees. A very intelligent, uh, very strong method, one of the very best methods we have in practice, often uh, beating uh, uh, deep learning um, in, in a variety of applications, definitely competing with it. And what you can see is that the optimal classification trees with, uh, with hyperplanes is in fact comparable in performance with, uh, with, with, um, with boosting methods. In other words, um, interpretability need not come, of course, the, 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 what is the, the big dream? The big dream is to have interpretable and state-of-the-art methods. And I would say this type of techniques uh, contribute in, towards this direction. Definitely optimal classification trees uh, competes, competes, I think, nicely with random forest. Uh, one of the very best methods that we have, only with one tree that is interpretable. So I would say uh, we make progress in this domain. So let's now consider some applications of this idea. So I, I'm reporting here of some work that I've done with two of my doctor friends, George Velmahos, who is the director of trauma at the Massachusetts General Hospital, one of the largest and most well-known hospitals in the United States in Boston and Hetham Kafarani, who is also, both are surgeons. And um, what we uh, did here is the following. We got data for about half a million patients from a database called NSQIP. This is a, a national database in the US, United States that for every, every observation, every row in that, uh, in that database represents a patient that has under, undergone a surgery, an emergency surgery in the emergency department. So, and what we're trying to, to do is we're trying to uh, understand the more before surgery. So somebody arrives in the emergency department, let's say in a coma, and would like to understand uh, if the person undergoes a particular type of surgery, what is the probability of mortality? What is the, the probability of developing any kind of morbidity and then specific morbidities? What's the probability of developing stroke within the, the next 30 days? What is the probability of developing sepsis? What is the probability of having kidney failure and so forth. 
so we had um, we published a paper on the annals of surgery um, using optimal classification trees and the method had uh, accuracies in uh, area under the term AUC in the low 90s, 91, 92%, compared with logistic regression for a variety of tasks, for all the tasks I mentioned, that had accuracy of the order of maybe low 80s. So, uh, so significantly more accuracy, and I would argue significantly more uh, interpretable. Why is it the case? So for example, so this is a particular uh, a, a particular uh, tree that demonstrates I have um, uh, I have cut the the, the, tree, the depth of the tree is actually more than three, but I to fit it in the in the graph I, I I finished it there. But look at what it asks. It tries to predict complication any complication post surgery. So the first question it asks uh, has the patient the patient had a transfusion in the last seventy two hours yes or no? If it's yes, then it asks for white blood count measurements, which indicates a degree of infection. If it's above a certain level or, or below a certain level, you ask different things. For example, is the patient septic? Uh, or what is the serum creatinine level uh, that measures the function of certain organs? So what is interesting is that this tree, what we have found, currently this, uh, this system is used at the Massachusetts General Hospital and a few other hospitals, uh, is, uh, is, is, is understandable, but at least experts. Uh, and, uh, and what we have found is that the way it is being used in, uh, at least at the Massachusetts General Hospital is in the morning rounds that start in the meeting at 6 a.m., they, they run these trees over all patients that arrived overnight, and, um, and they try to see if the, the trees predict any unusual complications, if, and also the trajectory, the interpretability be, is because a particular patient goes over a particular path and, and it might um, identify some things that even experienced physicians have not perhaps seen because it's based on the experience of about half a million surgeries and, uh, and growing because we utilize surgeries as, as they are being added. We have also built an application, this is how the interpretability works, um, namely that it asks a question. Um, for instance, it asks, I would, the, it asks a question, uh, is this, uh, I would like a specific complication and the, and the user selects acute renal failure. And then it basically asks consecutive questions. Uh, for example, what is the patient's preoperative serum creatinine level? De depending on the answer, another question and so forth. And in the end, it gives an outcome. It, it is also being utilized by physicians as a communication uh, tool for families. Let's say it predicts mortality 70%. It's not appropriate to mention to the family that everything is going to be fantastically well when seven out of 10 times the patient might in fact die. Um, so, the, so that's yet another use. You can actually download, if you like, the application. If you go to Potter, to either the iPhone uh, applications in, in, in the Apple store or the Android, and you go to Potter Medical, P-O-T-T-E-R, Potter Medical, you can actually download the application and, uh, and, and, um, and experiment with it. So we have also utilized uh, these methods in a variety of medical applications where interpretability is particularly important. I, I'll tell you one of my favorite ones. Um, uh, is the following. So uh, if somebody um, is in need of, of liver transplantation, is typically in a waiting list. Um, this is true in the United States, but I also believe it's true in the, in the UK. So, uh, so when a, a liver becomes available, there are certain people that are compatible from a blood perspective with, um, with the organ. And the question is who receives it? The nation in the United States, and I think it's internationally the case, um, they use an indicator called MELT. MELT represents three enzymes in the body that in a way, it's in a linear regression setting, it's a logistic regression model that predicts probability of mortality of the patient, how, how close death is in, in a way, what is the probability that somebody will be dying and therefore in great need of transplantation. 
and the person who receives the, the kidney, the, the liver, is the person who has the highest MEL score. So uh, this has been um, utilized in the United States for the last maybe 10, 12, 15 years with success. It's a current way that uh, alloc allocations of, uh, of livers are, is made. So what um, we have done is we have built a, an we use utilized data again for about 400, 500,000 patients that um, the, the, the system in the United States, UNOS, this is the, the, the body that oversees uh, transplantations in the United States. We have utilized this data and we've built an optimal classification tree. And what we have found is that um, the accuracy of predicting death is about six, 7% higher of relative to MELT. Uh, but most importantly, MELT, the current method in the United States, uh, disadvantages women and disadvantages cancer patients. But the current system that we built, um, the paper appeared uh, in, uh, in the American Journal of Transplantation, uh, does not have these issues. It does not, uh, it does not bias the system against women and it does not bias against, uh, and the bias is not uh, intentional. It's the, it's the fact that, uh, for example, cancer patients that uh, have, let's say, liver, uh, cancer in the liver are, look healthier than their condition really, uh, really is. In other words, um, it under the, the, male, the male system under, um, uh, does not accurately assess probability, uh, but our system uh, corrects for that. And then when we did simulations, uh, it decreases the number of deaths uh, by about uh, 10 to 15 percent in regions. In other words, by, uh, it, because it's more accurate in, in understanding who is the more accurate person to need the kidney because uh, the liver because of um, of eminent death, uh, it basically avoids a, a, la a sizable collection of deaths of the order of uh, maybe 300, um, whereas the number of the number of kidney transplantations in the United States is of the order of about 3,000. So um, again, the reason we have been uh, and we collaborated with uh, many physicians, the interpre interpretability of the method, of course, is accurate. But uh, we could achieve similar results with, let's say, uh, boosting methods. But the complication is that boosting methods, because of their uh, non-interpretability, was not particularly acceptable by physicians. And I would say the trees, uh, because of their, you know, the, the understanding they provide, has been a success in this way. We, last, last October, uh, we actually presented to the UNOS committee um, about a potential change of using our method, uh, these trees, based on MELD, and we are in ongoing discussions with UNOS for um, further testing and so forth. I could go on with many examples, but I would like to stop here for potentially asking, uh, you, know, uh, you know, receiving some questions on this part of the talk. Jorgen, are there any questions? Yes, there are quite a few questions. I'll just pick uh, some. Yes. Um, one question is about the difference between interpretability and explainability. Uh, I use them indistinguishably. Um, so in, in my, I don't want to go into technicalities here, but what I mean is when somebody looks at why somebody, let's say uh, in the examples I gave you, why somebody, the method predicts uh, high mortality, I could go through the tree and I can explain to somebody uh, uh, why it is the case that I believe that. So I use them indistinguishably, Jürgen. Okay. And then there's a question uh, about model agnostic explainability methods. So there are some techniques and the, uh, the person uh, named Lime and Trapp as examples. Yes, yes. yes. Um, yeah, I have utilized Lime and Sarp. Um, so this is, these are post, uh, these are methods that you, let's say you have a, a deep learning algorithm, neural network, it makes predictions. And then after the fact, you, you utilize these methods for uh, explanation. 
uh, in my view, these are local explanations. While I think they are steps in the right di direction, I do not believe that they are uh, particularly successful in uh, giving gigantic insight. It gives you some insight, not gigantic insight. And to, I would like to point you to two websites that where we, I have personally, we have made some comparisons. So there is a, a company I'm involved called Interpretable AI, Interpretable AI, one word, dot com. If you go to the website, you will see comparisons with Lime and Sharp and, um, and, and trees, and you will see the, the difference. On the other hand, in some cases, especially where trees are, on average, they are very strong, but they are not in every case. When the trees do not work as well, I would say using these methods is, um, is a step in the right direction as well. So I like them. I think it's a step in the right direction, but I, 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 would, I like methods that are more directly interpretable. And if we can make them as accurate as possible, I would see that's, that, that's an overall gain. Okay. Any then other there's a question about uh, runtime. So you have compared different methods based yeah. on out of sample accuracy, but <clears throat> do we runtime. pay for that in terms of runtime? Yes, we pay somewhat. So I would say compared to CART, which is an extraordinarily fast method, uh, I would say the optimal classification trees is maybe a factor of two to five. And I would say optimal classification with hyperplanes is a factor of 10. So you, you get a slowdown, uh, but in most situations, uh, if something, let's say, takes uh, seconds, even 10 times of that is still seconds, of course, if, if now it becomes hours, then it's less, less attractive. But uh, given uh, that we are using the machinery of optimization, uh, uh, that's, that's a price to pay. I think the price is reasonable, but it's not zero. From it, from it's, uh, it, it's a sizable gain on accuracy, but there is a, some slowdown in performance. Uh, so you can, we have also extensive comparisons on this in, in this website I told you, interpolai.com. Okay, I mean, there are, there are some more questions, but I suggest... Uh, go on. Okay, there will be another opportunity. So, so this is the most mathematically complicated slide. Please uh, bear with me for a minute. I think the benefits will be significant if you understand it. So uh, arguably the most, one of the most uh, well-cited uh, uh, and influential papers in applied mathematics has been the paper by Robert Tipsy Rani in 96 of... Uh, what's called lasso. So lasso uses regression for the, its purpose is to find sparse regression, namely the number of non-zero betas in the regression is small um, by adding uh, the L1 norm. So, uh, so this is the, the least square error. If you have data y and x, find betas, the least square error plus a coefficient, let's say lambda times the sum of the absolute values of the betas. That's the lasso. Uh, so this is a very different approach. This is an exact uh, optimi mixed integer optimization approach that adds a regularizer term. This is rich regression for robustness. We have established that uh, adding regularizers like lasso or um, a rich term is, uh, is useful for immunizing the problem in a robust optimization setting against errors in data. But we have a a, an explicit constraint that the sum of uh, the non-zero betas, what's called the zeroth norm, is less than k. So this is uh, finding least squares, solving regression problems with regularization for robustness and with sparsity. Okay. That's a classical and I think important problem, one of the most important problems in regression. And I'm about to tell you for, after all, this is an OR conference, I would like to, to tell you something that when I first, we first derived it, this is joint work with Bart Van Paris that recently appeared in Annals of Statistics. Um, we do something unusual. We basically have betas and the, the typical way to solve this problem is the, the big M method. This is what we talk, talk to our students. We define uh, variables SI and we say absolute value beta I is less than some big M times ZI in a linear way. And then we, we try to solve uh, this problem. And the complication is the big M is sometimes complicated because it, the relaxations that you get are not very strong. So here I do something unusual. I actually, whenever I see beta I, I have beta I times SI and SI are binaries, right? SI zero or one, 
and the sum of a size is less than k. So the problem, therefore, can now be written as whenever you see beta, you see si times beta. Of course, si squared equals si because si is zero or one. So this is the this part, the regularizing part. And then whenever you see beta, it's a it's a diagonal matrix S. The diagonals are si s one s two s n times beta. So now I, I I wrote this problem in the problem of minimizing s k, minimizing s the sum of s i is less than k, and um, and s is zero or one. And then I in the inner problem I minimize over beta, where um, where I have this form. So nothing happened. This form, this problem here, and this problem here are exactly equivalent. But this problem is is nonlinear. The nonlinearity. So I introduce nonlinearity on purpose, which is not what we teach our students. So we, we have um, you know third degree polynomials, si beta i squared, si beta i, and so forth. So we we gave up on linearity. The benefit of doing that is we don't have big M methods anymore. This is an ex there are no artificial numbers. This is an exact reformulation without big M method. And now we make the following observation: a simple one, but a crucial one. You know, the reason I wrote it that way is because the inner problem here as a function of beta is a quadratic problem, right? So S in that inner optimization is fixed. So fix the S and then optimize over beta. If you optimize over beta, that's an exact closed form solvable problem that uh, we know how to solve from calculus. So if you do the calculation, you find you the closed form solution, you plug it in, and now this, the original problem is now formulated as this problem of minimizing uh, this formula, one half y transpose, y is data, an identity matrix plus gamma, the sum of sj, kj, kj's, the rank one matrix xj, xj transpose, inverse y. So this function is convex in S. Just to be, and the reason this is convex is the matrix k is semi-definite. If you, just to see if it's one dimension, this is a problem, this is a constant over one plus gamma s, and the constant is positive. So this is obviously a convex function. This generalizes to multiple dimensions. So we reduce the problem exactly to a binary, because still we're optimizing over binary variables, convex optimization problem. And there's no approximation here. That's an exact reformulation. Um, just a comment of linking interpretability to sparsity. In, in, in a variety of problems, k is typically is quite small. We want models with five, 10 variables. Even you might have a potential of hundreds of variables. So the fact that we have uh, a small number of variables really is an interpretability question. Uh, there's also the problem of sparsity is also relevant what you call in high dimensional statistics in which you have, let's say a thousand observations, but let's say 10,000 factors. And clearly without sparsity, the problem is not well defined because clearly if you have a thousand uh, observations, 10,000 factors, you can make the error zero by many choices of, of betas. Uh, uh, but sparsity is, is a necessity on, in the high dimensional regime. And what we have accomplished in this slide is um, in a relatively simple mathematics, I have to admit, is we reformulated the problem into a convex optimization problem subject to binary constraints. Now, these problems can be solved by uh, cutting planes in the following way. So let's say you want to minimize the function C of S. So what do you do pictorially is you have an initial solution. You find a, a plane that leaves the function on the, on the, on the right of it. It's, it's feasible because it is convex. You find a new optimum. You find a new hyperplane and a new hyperplane. And uh, in that way, when you opt, so instead of optimizing over the initial function, you start optimizing over this linear approximation, and then you solve this successively by mixed integer uh, optimization, um, actually binary, really, only one variable. Uh, the objective function is continuous. All of the other variables are binary, so really binary optimization problem. This you can solve it by mixed integer methods. Uh, binary optimization methods that are commercial solvers, Gurobi, Cplex, and other methods can, can handle this problem. And what we have found is that uh, you only need very few iterations to find an optimal, a provably optimal solution using cutting planes. 
So you solve a succession of uh, integer optimization problems. One problem is the same as before, except that it has an additional one constraint, something you can exploit in uh, what is called lazy constraints. In these modern solvers, they support the idea of uh, adding one constraint at a time without re reconstructing the, the overall branch and boundary. So uh, now, the, so now I, what I would like to say is that it's coming back to the initial comment I made regarding beliefs about complexity, namely mixed integer optimization problem is intractable and th that's the belief and therefore heuristic methods like LASSO are necessary. And uh, you see here that perhaps a different picture is emerging. This is small sparsity, 10, 20, 30, but that's typical in applications. And you have here 50,000 variables, 100,000 variables, 200,000 variables, and number of observations 10, 20, 100,000. So these are arguably large scale problems. And these are not artifi necessarily artificial problems. I, I started working on this problem in addressing a problem on cancer. Namely, you have a thousand patients that have um, uh, adenocarcinoma. And you have of the order of 50,000 uh, gene expressions that might explain the adenocarcinoma. So you have a, a thousand by 50,000, N equals a thousand, uh, P equals uh, 50,000 uh, factors. Um, sparsity is necessary here. So you, you basically need to see what uh, genes are relevant for this particular type of adenocarcinoma in trying to address severity of disease. Uh, and um, sparsity with 10 factors is what we're trying to find, namely which, which genes are the ones that are responsible predominantly for the severity of the disease in adenocarcinoma. So, uh, so it's, a it's a practically relevant story. And what this says is the following. So this is the, the computation um, time in seconds to find uh, a provably optimal solution. This is the time in, that LASSO takes in seconds. This is the time this optimization-based method takes. LASSO solves a linear optimization model. They solve it using gradient methods very, very efficiently. And we use the best method that we know. Gimlet uh, is, the, is a particular software that people from Stanford developed. And you can see the fact who is faster is not relevant, but we are in the same ballpark. In fact, it is uh, a faster method to use the integer optimization than to use uh, the heuristic method. Uh, of course, this alone is not so important, but it does uh, basically say that the beliefs that the, at least the statistical community has that mixed integer optimization is impractical needs to be revised. Uh, the, the, the most important question really is, do, they find the, do these methods find the truth and only the truth? So we devise an artificial experiment to demonstrate that. So we generate uh, a true model, we have some true values. Th this is a, 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 a synthetic experiment to demonstrate the how accurate the methods are. So we, gen we add noise and the noise has zero mean and has uh, uncorrelated noise in this case. We also can add correlated noise. So we run LASSO and we run uh, the exact method. And uh, we record the, the accuracy. How many, let's say there are 30 coefficients to get this 30, how many of the 30 true non-zero coefficients you get? So if you get, let's say 20, you have two thirds accuracy. And then the false positive rate, let's say you, you lasso generates, let's say 60 uh, coefficients. And let's say all 30 of them are correct. So the accuracy is 100%, but the false positive rate is 50% because in generating to get the, the, true, the truth, you get, you also have 30 additional coefficients that are not there. You are, in, in, in other words, they are not correct. So, um, so perfect support recovery requires you to find the whole truth, namely A equals 100%, and nothing but the truth, namely F equals zero. So that's sort of perfect, perfect recovery, right, of finding the truth. And what I do next in this experiment, I plot you know, if, you, if I was losing you, this might be a good time to recon, uh, re, uh, rejoin because I think it tells you something that I think is interesting. 
So on the, on the horizontal axis, I have n, the number of observations. This vertical axis is the time, this is the accuracy, and this is the false positive rate. Red is uh, the index of programming stuff, the, the blue is lasso, the predominant method today. And what you see in the first slide, the first uh, panel, is that lasso is always fast. Uh, the, 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 the exact spart spar spar sparsity method is not very fast in the beginning, but when you have enough signal, then it's as fast, in fact, faster as we have seen, okay? So I would say on that front, advantage is lasso. Now, this is the accuracy. So you observe that after a certain point, about here, lasso and the optimal, the, the optimal method are 100% accurate, except that the, the optimal method is accurate earlier. In other words, it's, it's, the red curve, as far as accuracy is concerned, is concerned, is above the blue curve in the beginnings more significantly. At some point, it catches on, and I would say um, there is an advantage here to the L0 method. But one would say with enough points, lasso catches on. But the last part, I would say, is the most interesting and perhaps important, is that the, the red method, the optimal method, after this threshold, this, uh, which is actually about the same th threshold, has zero false recovery. In the beginning, there is false recovery because they don't have enough signal, but lasso never recovers. In other words, that um, no matter if you have very large data sets, you still have false recovery. So false recovery comes from the fact that it doesn't solve the exact problem. So, and that's an inherent, uh, an inherent difficulty. And, and that's not an academic uh, story in my view. In the, in the example with uh, the adenocarcinoma, I told you, um, when we ran, in, when we ran um, the, the, the heuristic methods, lasso on, uh, on, this, on this type of data, we found that the number of genes were about 120, 130. That's not actionable. You cannot build drugs with so many genes affected. And we knew when we ran uh, the methods with the exact integer, we found 10. So 10 is actionable, but 120, 130 is not so actionable. And, 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 and it is true that the 10, that the optimal method, the integer optimization method were among the 130, but there were many others we did not know a priori what they were. So I would say in certain applications uh, where exact understanding in a sense, interpretability is material, utilizing discrete optimization methods, which are now uh, have improved, as I have indicated, uh, namely they can solve very large scale problems, a hundred thousand, uh, hundreds of thousands um, are, are now within reach. I would say it, it's time for us to, to, to do it. And I would say OR has, the field of operational research has, has something, in my opinion, interesting to contribute in the dialogue about uh, uh, utilizing these methods for, uh, for machine learning and statistics problems. And, and, and LASSO has been in the forefront of, uh, of statistical research in the last 25 years or so. That's a point also to ask more questions, uh, Jürgen. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, there was one question about the problem of bias um, that these machine learning models may have if you train them on historical data. Uh, uh, it's fair. And, and the way we try to do it is we do out of sample experiments. That's actually relevant to the third part of the talk. Namely, that we have validation and uh, training and validation sets. We select parameters to do as, as, well, as, we, as well as we can on the, on the validation set, trying to decrease bias. There are theoretical analyses about uh, trying to find uh, what the exact bias and so forth is. The, the way I, I, the, the community is trying to address it is with proper cross-validation or validation methods. More on this in a minute, in the, in the third part of the talk. Time permitting, I will have something to say on that. 
Okay. There was one question on whether you have looked at the robustness of the explanations that you derive from your model. So if you had slightly different data, would the tree look completely different and your explanation Fantastic. Would be completely Interesting different? Interesting enough, I just wrote a paper, we just submitted it to General Machine Learning Research with the title, Stable Optimal Trees. So we actually looked into that and it's related to what I'm about to tell you again. It seems that I postpone everything for the next, but it's the case. Okay, so let's, let's I have something to say on this. Future. Yeah, so let me continue. So, uh, so, um, so this, uh, this is a, the last part of the talk is about stable regression, which is very much related with the questions people, people asked. Namely, uh, the, the current paradigm for selecting uh, how to train machine learning models uh, is a traditional randomization approach developed by Taki in 1968. You are, we are given data, you get a random subset that is placed to the side the test set, and on the remaining set, we randomly split into training and validation. We build models on training, we select parameters on validation, we select the best parameters, we retrain the model for the entire data, and then we report on testing once. So um, now the complication is that sometimes the coefficients of the regression are not stable at all. And let's say you do this for trees. Trees are, are known, CART is an example, where uh, the gentleman or the lady who asked the question is right, there, there is instability there. That is, if you change the data, you have sometimes different trees and therefore the robustness of the explanation is not always fantastic. So I, I am about to explain um, how to address it and listen regression in this paper that you can find in, hopefully in my website, you can look at the same solution, similar ideas for trees. So to give you the severity of the example, let me select an example because you have 350 patients, you have uh, 10 baseline variables. This is for predicting homoglobin A1C. This is a measure of glucose level uh, for the person. You have 10 baseline variables, age, sex, cholesterol levels, and so forth. And then you also consider their product interaction. So you have 10 variables, 10 choose two, 45 variables, plus 10, 55, you have 55 variables, 350 patients, and you run regression. So you run, you, you do ordinary least squares, um, and, uh, and you lasso, in fact, you, you find the coefficients, right? And then you do another random collection, and now you find new coefficients, and something surprising happens. Namely, if you look at the LDL and the HDL coefficients, they change sign. It's not that they were 291 or 289, it was, this is not a typo, minus 262, and it's, it's basically, this is the worst kind of, uh, of model in which the, even though the accuracy of the model is high, the interpretability of the model is not good because the, the first model tells you uh, HDL decreases glucose. The second model tells you it increases it. And, and not by a little bit, by sizable amounts. So that's a problem. And this is, I would say, one of the issues with that is the lack of robustness. Similar things happen in trees, as the gentleman or the lady suggested. So how do we train so I would like to propose a method for doing it, but it's motivated by the way we train for exams. All of you are um, OR practitioners and academics. Uh, I bet all of you have been strong students. They have good, uh, strong exam takers. And at least with the way I train for exams, I typically trained on problems that were difficult for me to solve. I trained on the most difficult problems. And to motivate that, consider the following, uh, way of training. So let's say you still put 10% of your data randomly as a test set. Now you have 100 points and you would like to utilize optimization as opposed to randomization of selecting which is the training set and which is the validation set. So let me define ZI is one or zero if the point is in the training set and ZI equals, ZI equals one and ZI equals zero if it's in the validation set. So we minimize over beta as we usually do, except that we find, we try to find the maximum over all choices of the i's such that the sum of the i's equals k, let's say k equals 70% uh, of the data. So again, I repeat, we have the data, 10% of the data we set aside for testing randomly, to, not to bias the data, but the rest we basically find, uh, let's say, 
we, the training set is 70 percent and the and the validation set is 30 percent this is a parameter chosen by us to to find to minimize over the worst um residuals and this is a regularization term could be last or could be ridge and so forth so so notice that this is not a traditional way of doing it we are minimizing instead of randomizing randomization will be a, a random subset of the data we are finding the worst examples so this sounds a bit peculiar but uh, that uh, we are solving a discrete optimization problem it seems that i'm doing crazy things but it's not so crazy because it's a, as, as as a function of z of the variables uh that we are optimizing in the inner problem th these are binary variables it's a linear function over binary variables so the problem is equivalent to minimizing a li this linear function of z over the convex hull which is easy to explain easy to write it's just zi between zero and one the sum of zi is equals k so then the, the problem of maximizing this problem subject to this is a linear optimization problem you can find the dual of the problem, a linear optimization dual. And if you substitute this dual and optimize over beta outside, you have, um, in the end, a very tractable problem, which for the case of Lasso, if this is absolute value, is a linear optimization problem, not integer, even though I started with an integer. So you solve an inter a linear optimization problem, if, if this is a rich regression, it's a quadratic problem, very, very tractable problems that we can solve in uh, very high dimensions. So this problem is tractable. The question is, is it any good? Uh, and what I will in, I, illustrate here is that this is um, some data sets. Uh, this is the dimensions, N and P. Let's take, uh, as an example, a 70, 30. Random, this is on the, on the test set, not on the validation set. You know, we select betas in the, uh, under randomization or under optimization, and you observe that the optimization solution has an edge out of sample in performance. So um, sometimes more significant, sometimes less, but, but it's, let's say on the 50-50, I would say 64-33 versus 68-89, that's about uh, easily 6% uh, and so forth. So there is an edge in optimization um, in terms of prediction accuracy. You can also look at on the standard deviation of, um, of the solution as well, of the prediction. The standard deviation is also not only the accuracy uh, is um, is uh, is better. It's also the standard deviation is better. Um, then the standard deviation of the coefficients is stronger, which is an important. That's the stability story, as we discussed. So, uh, standard deviation of the coefficients is an indicator of stability of the model. This is what the gentleman or the lady was asking that uh, by using optimization, you can improve on that. And the solution we have on trees actually does spectacularly well on that front. So in other words, if you combine these ideas uh, with optimal classification trees, you have far more stable trees, which is a well-known problem for CART. Um, and I would recommend as a, as a solution method. Uh, I don't have time to go into support recovery, but also if you will combine support recovery, what I was telling you beho before, with uh, this method, you observe that uh, the accuracy is better um, and uh, the, the false discovery rate is also better. In other words, the, the sim similar techniques, uh, similar uh, conclusions that we have seen before uh, are the same. So of, these ideas um, of using optimization methods in, in classical machine learning problems extend to a variety of problems. The book I mentioned has uh, summarizes at least my efforts, the efforts of my group in this area um, for matrices, for other problems um, in, in uh, machine learning and so forth. And, um, oops. and um, one second. In conclusion, I, would, the, the, I made several points in this talk, namely that interpretability matters and OCTs and optimal regression trees do provide high quality state of the art solutions that are interpretable, uh, that we can solve sparse regression problems exactly to prove over optimi optimality typically in minutes, uh, that they have an edge for detecting sparsity 
uh, that optimization is, in my opinion, is a contender, a contender of a randomization in a variety of problems. And the book I mentioned um, last year has um, several examples that demonstrate that. Um, I would say that um, a key thing that I would like to leave you with is that I believe we need to reconsider deeply rooted beliefs on what is difficult and the need for relaxations to solve uh, problems. I would say bringing the machinery of mixed integer optimization, which is one of the uh, strongest things that our community has developed over the years, really a collective effort over 70 years, starting with the work of Danzig and Gomori and uh, the care and codes of Gurobi, Simplex, and others. Uh, all of what I have said is now in codes um, in a company called Interpretable AI. You can, uh, you can take a look at it. And uh, the, the software is free for academics, uh, for industry we have a licensing fee. So on that front, I would like to conclude the talk and open it for questions. I very much thank you for listening to me for the last hour. Jürgen? Thank you very much, uh, Dimitris. That was really an amazing talk. Um, there are still quite a few questions, so I'm not sure we can cover all of them, but let, let's start somewhere. Yes. Uh, one question was about uh, handling correlated variables. Um, Yes, fantastic question. So I have um, in the book uh, and also I have published a paper recently, uh, Holistic Regression, in which you can actually use optimization when, let's say, because you can calculate variables that are, you can find the correlation of variables. You can say uh, colon one and colon two are correlated. So you can actually def 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 devise variables S, I, and S, J. Zero, one, if you, call, if you select the column or not, then you can put a constraint, SI plus SJ is less than or equal to one if the correlation is above a certain level. So you can actually use optimization to actually guide you in the selection of, uh, of variables. So you now make regression, not an art that more or less is, exists today of how to put all these requirements, but actually do it uh, in a way that is uh, more scientific with optimization guiding you. The paper appeared in Operation Research Letters uh, 2020. Okay, then there was a question on the relation between stable regression that you explained and epsilon tube of uh, support vector machine regression. I'm not sure it's a very specific question. Uh, to be honest, uh, I, I don't know this, uh, you know, perhaps the, the questioner can send me an email explaining to me because I do not know the title. So uh, I'm sorry that I don't know it but I really don't, so. Um. Yeah, no, no problem. Uh, I think it's, it was very specific. Um, uh, then there was a question about uh, uncertainty and confidence prediction. So. Yes, and uh, in, in other words, confidence intervals and so forth. Yes, you can. Um, what we have, in fact, in the, in the paper on stable trees that is uh, submitted to JMLR, General Machine Learning Research, with actually output confidence intervals, as well as in, this, in the stable regression, uh, paper uh, that, I, that I presented. I forgot to mention this was joint work with my student, Ivan Paskov from MIT. And um, we output confidence intervals. And, uh, and what we observe is that the confidence intervals for stability methods are far smaller than randomization methods. It's far more accurate when we predict, uh, as, the as the method suggests, as the name suggests, stability comes with uh, less wide confidence intervals. Okay. Uh, then one question is whether you could say something about handling categorical variables. Yes, the, all the methods handle categorical variables, trees, for example. And if you download the package, you will see it can handle both categorical uh, variables as well as continuous variables. Um, naturally, in other words, uh, the, the method is not restricted to non-categorical variables. It covers all the variables. Okay. There's, there's one question um, that is maybe particularly British um, because I don't know whether you have heard in the US, but because of COVID-19, the uh, high school, uh, the A-levels, the for, for, for high, yes. high school leaving certificate, uh, the students were not tested. Yes. And so it was very difficult to decide what should we do, uh, which students can we admit to university, uh, uh -huh. basically. Uh, and the government came up with uh, an algorithm that was perfectly interpretable 
uh, to, to predict the students' grades based on past results and teachers' recommendations, etc. cetera. Um, but many, many students were unhappy about the prediction and felt disadvantaged. And there were some, some statistics that showed that, yeah, if, if you came from, from an underperforming school, then you were disadvantaged. Yeah. So in yeah. the end, the government had to scrap the scheme uh, <laughs> and basically say, okay, we just use teacher predictions. Yeah. So the, 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 the questionnaire asks for how do you handle missing data? So, uh, no, I think the question is, is, is interpretability enough? Will, will it not I, just lead to a lot of controversy? Yeah, but, but, but believe me, imagine if the government had a black box algorithm that was not interpretable and, and, and uh, interpretability enabled at least to understand what it is doing and enabled, you know, if one of the variables was the, the particular you know, socio, you know, the school district that the person was coming, which is very much related with socioeconomic factors, that an, an interpretable algorithm will have that. I would say that gives you some credibility to say there is bias in the algorithm. If I, I, interpretability is not enough, but in my opinion, it's necessary, uh, but not sufficient to, to make uh, such decisions. Uh, it, at the very least, it tells us that there's something fishy going on because it uses variables that should not be used. If it was a black box, like a, a, a deep learning or something, try to understand that, try to understand, then you, have, you can talk about correlations, but not in your face explanations. And similarly with explanations like after the fact, uh, Lime and Sharp, it's not in your face explanations, it's explanations that try to capture some correlations that might or might not be there. So my answer is, uh, a, a, interpretability is, in my opinion, in social important factors necessary, but unfortunately not sufficient. Okay. Um, then there's one question about, can this model be applied to longitudinal panel data? This model meaning stable regression? I don't know exactly. Um, I, I will go over all three then. So longitudinal panel data, uh, stable regression or trees can, it's not restricted. I would say the answer is yes. In fact, I have utilized it in one application on, uh, in, uh, with census data, both uh, support recovery as well as uh, stable regression. I think the answer is yes. The, the, the questioner might have some specific thing in mind, but uh, I don't have enough detail, but my answer is yes.